I arrived, Margaret and I, arrived at the University of Alberta in the summer of 1971. We had been to Edmonton because that was the major city on the way to the Northwest Territory, so we had been there before. Um, the reason I took the job there, well, even in those days, it was not easy to get a job. But the reason that I took that job, whereas other people thought going there was probably, well, Trudeau once said about, if it wasn't about, the other, the older Trudeau, once said if it, if it wasn't, uh, he said, I think he said something like, Edmonton is not the end of the world, but you can see the end of the world from Edmonton. So people, <laughs> people really, you know, it was pretty far out of the, out of the normal tracks that people made, especially someone from New York like me, um, you know, to end up in Edmonton was quite a surprise. And in fact, um, Margaret Mead at one point, I was her TA um, um, for a while, uh, and I saw her at a conference and she said, are you happy there? But I said I was, and I was. Um, because um, it was very close to where I did my field work. So it's like, you know, taking a job in, at, at a university in Brazil because you work in Brazil. It was similar, similar attitude as that. Um, and the Indian Hospital for the Northwest Territories was in Edmonton, and so we'd have a lot of people come and come, and we could spend time. And in fact, Jesse Hardesty got a re relapse of her TB when we were there, and so we could actually spend a year taking her around while she recovered. So we felt really good about that. Um, they wanted me to teach linguistic anthropology and cultural anthropology and social structure. Um, linguistic anthropology is really hard. I, 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 I did my best, but I'm not really a linguistic anthropologist. The cultural part was fine. The social structure was okay. And I did that at, at, at first. Um, but pretty quickly, meaning by 1970 three or so, but certainly after 75, I got quite involved in political stuff again. Um, there was the Mackenzie Valley Pipeline, and it was about building a pipeline, gas pipeline, from the north coast, uh, the Arctic coast, through the Northwest Territories into Alberta and then down. Um, and the Dene were opposed to it on the grounds particularly that they had the right to make the final decision on what was going to take place on their lands and that it was going to destroy their way of life. Okay, those two grounds. Um, they asked me to give testimony at the Berger Commission, and I did what was called past and present land use, and it really used the articulation of modes of production argument to show that the Dene could be participating in a modern economy at the same time they were participating in a subsistence economy and how they were doing the two things at the same time. The irony is that it was a very effective argument, if we look at it in intellectual terms, against the argument being proposed by the oil companies, or the, I'm sorry, the, the gas companies, which was 
that their way of life was dying and that they would need jobs to replace these and this would provide them with good jobs, which turns out to be kind of Eric Wolf's argument in um, um, Europe and what is it, in the people without history, anyway, ends up to be pretty well, that's his argument, you know, and, and he does a piece on the Denny, which is exactly like that. They lost their way at the time of the fur trade and now they're just peasants within the capitalist mode of production. So here, here, here is a proof that maybe this uh, this French salon form of Marxism is some pretty strong political weight to it. So anyway, we won that. We won that, and they didn't build the pipeline. Um, so then, the Dennett asked me if I would be part of their brain trust for negotiating political relations with Canada. And so I said yes, and so right away, about 1979 or so, I had just gotten back from a sabbatical, um, 1979 or so, I took, I took that on. And I then became the director of research for their claims, all the while teaching one or two courses at the university. So basically on secondment, I didn't want it to be a contract. So basically they bought out part of my salary and then that was then considered part of my normal work. So that's, so I never really taught all that much in the department. Um, but I did spend my time really, really interesting work with the with the Dene on uh, on negotiating. Yeah, I learned a lot about that stuff. So another form of my activism, I guess. Yeah, and yeah, and uh, one of the things that we did was called the Dene Mapping Project. Um, which, uh, which I'm just thinking I have a copy of a picture of it, but I don't think it'd be too, I don't think it'll, it'll be visually all that interesting. It'd take a lot of time to set it up. Um, I'll show it to you after, but um, I, um, in the, at the time of the Mackenzie Valley Pipeline hearings, the Dene got money to do mapping of their traditional territories. And their traditional territories are 600,000 square kilometers. So it's not a small area, it's the size of Western Europe. And they had 600 hunter trappers do this, do this, and then they have them, all these maps. And then I went in the office in Yellowknife one day and I see this guy trying to put them all together and I ask him what he's doing and he tells me and I, and I said, I wonder if we can't do better than that. So. As luck would have it, my next door neighbor was a, um, a computer a geologist, um, one of the earliest. He was mapping underground rivers in Alberta. And I told him what the issue was and he said, well, I'm going to help you so that you can do this extensive uh, computer map of what's going on with the Dene, where you can actually say on these pieces of trail, this is what was happening in what in certain years. So he did that with us. He, we worked out this program. So we've got this massive um, database in which you can go to anywhere in this 600,000 square kilometers and you put your finger in the 10 kilometer square and you say, well, what went on there? And it'll say, in 1932, it was used by hunters from such and such a place for this, for that, in 1950, so on, so like that, right? So we so we did that. and. There was a big politics around around whether we would ever use it because the Dene leadership, especially George Erasmus, was of the view that the government had to prove that it had sovereignty and we didn't have to prove that we had land use. And they couldn't prove that they had sovereignty, so why are we wasting our time doing this? But 
the reason we waste our time doing it is that we could give it back to the communities, which would be helpful to them. But we ultimately persuaded him that it would be useful for the government to know that we actually did have this stuff and we did run it and they shut up about that matter <laughs> subsequently. Anyway, so that, that was an important that was an important thing. Yeah. Uh, and then had this so I wrote a book, which I'll show you at some point. Um, in the middle of this big change in my in my politics. So up until the are we in the right place? Uh, up until the mid up until the middle of the time I was doing this, I was focused on my work. What can I do to help to then achieve what I think is a just solution, which is having a recognized right of self determination as a colonized people. What what and making sure that their ways are not being trampled on by us and so on and so forth. There came this moment in the middle of of all of this work that I'm doing where I said, you know, but the Dene want is really easy to understand. And given the way this world is today, it's really a very moderate position. Most colonized peoples would not be happy with that kind of position. Why are we so resistant to this idea? What is it about us? That, and that I changed my whole course of work, I didn't do any more research in the North, and I started to do only research on the way in which we have come to understand that we don't need to deal with these people. Now, I could have done it from a materialist point of view, but this is where I said no, because that's too easy. I mean, I can prove that it's in our interest not to do it, but that doesn't really get to how do you get people to do something about it? You know, like you can label this stuff and what's wrong, but what's going on in their heads that that makes it okay for them to 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 ignore this stuff? And I started off by going after the state, and I've spent I spent about I guess fifteen twenty years twenty years going after the way, the ideology that Canada uses to justify its uh, its claim of sovereignty and jurisdiction. Um, yeah, and I, 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 anyway, and in the middle of that, I wrote this book in 1984 called Home and Native Land, which is all about this problem and how we can overcome it. And I use what the Dene had proposed as a solution, as a as a way of of dealing with it, right? So that's that was that. A very profound moment in my life, and I teach this um, in my classes. I really emphasize this moment. Um, happened right at the end of these negotiations that were taking place between the federal government and the Dene. When the federal government finally said we are not going to negotiate your political rights. You have to choose to take the kind of policy that we're offering or we're going to move on to another community after 10 years. Um, and there was a meeting in Yellowknife and I was the director of research, so I went to it from Edmonton which is not much different than going from Montreal to Quebec City, but it maybe take a little longer, but it's like that. They're, they're reasonably close to each other. Um, and I went to this meeting of chiefs, and the chiefs were complaining about uh, that they had to make a decision. And one leader and I think it was, his name was George Kazuski said, what we've been trying to do is build a house with the white man. 
The treaty, which is something they negotiated in 1921, is the foundation. And this agreement that we've been working on is supposed to be one of the walls. But all the white man wants to do is tear down the house and build a house in his name for us to live in. And I thought that really did capture what the problem was. And it stuck in my mind. So then I take the plane home and I'm teaching the next day, which happens to be my birthday. And in Yellowknife, the chiefs, there are 27, I think, are sitting around a table with the Minister of Indian and Northern Affairs and discussing whether they're going to make a, the final agreement. They're going to sign the final agreement. And my class, I think, runs from 2 to 3.30. And so they're still in the meeting because it's the same time zone. They're still in the meeting in Yellowknife. And so I go in my class, which is a Native Studies class, and I say, okay, up in Yellowknife, and I've talked about this before, and so it won't sp didn't spring on them. I said, so, up in Yellowknife, they're talking about um, whether they should sign the deal. At 3.30, this class is over at 3.20. At 3.20, you're going to have to vote as to whether you're going to sign the deal or not. These are students who are in Edmonton. They've got no stake in this whatsoever. So, But for an hour, I'm going to just answer any questions that you have. But you have to tell me who you're asking, because I will give you a true answer. But depending on who it is, it'll be very different. If it's the federal person, it'll be very different than if it's the then a person who wants it, an agreement or doesn't want an agreement and so on. So you have to tell me who who's, who's answering. Okay, so they do that for about an hour and at three o'clock I say, okay, it's time to vote. First thing, can we have more time? Kids say, in Yellowknife the chiefs are saying, can we have more time? Do I say, no. You can't. And up in your life, the minister is saying the engine, the plane is on a tarmac and the engine is running. If I don't have a yes by 5.30, it's no. Okay, so no, you can't have more time. So you got to vote. Now in Yellowknife, the chiefs are voting by standing up. So I want you to vote. You're standing up. Yeah, and I'm saying, you know, these are kids who are just taking a class. I mean, really, uh, there was no, it was the level of pressure on them was certainly not the same as going on in your life. But none of them would stand up. So I started racking my brain as to what the heck to do. So I said, okay, secret ballot. So about 10 after. Three, I pass around to the 30 kids, I pass around the secret ballot. No one turns in a ballot. No one. No one. They wouldn't do it. So then I said, what the hell am I going to do? And then it comes to me, it's like the creator said, Pfft. I said, I'm going to tell you what, you all voted. And here's the answer. Half of you voted yes, and half of you voted no. Should the people who vote yes go with the people who voted no so we can maintain unity? Or should the people who voted no go with the people who voted yes so we, so we can maintain unity? Or should we just split? Now, they didn't answer that. They, they walked out of the class, but in Yellowknife, what happened? The, they had to have someone stand up, and he reluctantly stood up. And then all of the other chiefs stood up. So it looked like they had agreed. But then I called the national chief, and I asked him, well, was there a drum dance? And he said, 
I remember him saying no, but I, he was just here two weeks ago, and he said, no, there was a, a drum dance, but it wasn't well attended. But in either case, if there's not a drum dance, or it's not well attended, it's not a yes, no matter what happened. So then we had this big meeting afterwards, and the Dene Nation split apart after being together for all these years of negotiations. So different regions started to negotiate their own. And it came to me then, then this is why I changed my research and everything completely. It came to me then that this is not about the Dene. As I said earlier, what they're asking for is not outlandish. It's not unreasonable. It makes all kinds of sense in this world that we're living in. The problem is, why do we put people in such a position? And when we do put people in such a position, isn't it really healthy when they split? Because, going back to my own my the biblical history, my Jewish or my biblical history. How many times do you read in the Old Testament that the Jews are asked to bow down in front of some god or they'll be killed, right? Well, if they had all bowed down, they'd all been killed and there'd be no more Jews. If none of them had bowed down, they'd all have assimilated, there'd be no more Jews. It is clear that some did, and those that didn't carried the story of those who did, and that's what enabled the maintenance of this. So every time I see something like that, I, I say, that's probably a healthy answer in an impossible kind of situation. So my job is to figure out how to change us so we don't put people in that situation. So that's what my anthropology became. And it really is an anthropology that way. Like I look at, uh, I look at the Supreme Court like they're elders because they are in the sense that they, the statements that they make, you need to follow them whether you agree with them or not because they have that kind of authority. Um, we have charter myths old school anthropology. Hobbes' story of Leviathan is the Western charter myth. You cannot beat that myth because it's a myth, because it's an orienting thing, because it's so deep. It's something that, you know, when, when Evans Pritchard talked about them caring about the cattle so much that they organize everything around that, you know, and we, and we kind of laughed at it because that's kind of primitive. No, oh, we do that. That's exactly what we do. So I do treat this all like anthropology, and I'm the anthropologist who's trying to study all this stuff and figure out where the cracks are, because again, I'm an activist. Where are the cracks in this that we can move ahead? And in that sense, remain sort of in the Marxist tradition, because, because uh, Marx didn't say, look for contradictions because they're interesting. He said, look for contradictions because they're the places that you can actually move the system. So where are the problems, where are the problems within, the, uh, within the model that we have created for ourselves that give us the opportunity to move past it? So that's what I've done since.